we have a, a guest you haven't met uh, yet. Uh, this is Albert Dixon, who uh, was on the town board several years ago. He took a, a breather, uh, and now he's, he's going to be back on. This is Jamie Cook and Kate Klebinski, and they're from the Island Institute, and they're uh, visiting uh, AIM, and they're on sort of a fact-finding mission as part of the ETIP program. And yesterday we did an island tour visiting the South Ferry Recycling Center, the school, the police department, the library. And today they're going to continue going to Sylvester Manor and they're going to meet with Bridge Hunt. Uh, let's talk about the North Ferry. Uh, and then they're dashing off this afternoon to go back to Maine, I think, right? Yeah. Uh, okay. So, um, We'll get to the discussion in a moment. We just have three quick things to uh, do for the green committee. Uh, first of all, has everybody read the minutes? Okay. I have a motion to. I have a couple of very small corrections that I, I'll just give to Christina about any substance. Okay. All right. So, uh, everybody. A motion to approve with my tiny corrections. Okay. Yep. Second. All in favor? Okay. Um, we have a new member to our green committee, <coughs> Obi. Welcome. Welcome. Thank you. Nice to be here. Thank you. Um, and then finally, um, this is a draft um, of the dates for uh, 2024. Um, just take a look. You can always, as we have in the past, if something comes up, Switch something we can. Otherwise, uh, if everybody's okay, we'll just go ahead with the schedule. Okay. Take it from there. Okay. Is there no December meeting? Uh, well, this is 2024. This is 2024. Yes, there yeah. is a December yeah, meeting. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Uh, there is a December meeting. And uh, speaking of which, Beth Fettini who is spearheading an EP, um, let's describe as uh, EB, sort of opening, uh, trying to sort of spread the word about EB's electric vehicles. She wanted to do something uh, here in December. Um, Christina and I both felt that it was not a great time to attract a lot of people to look at electric vehicles. So, we suggested either after Memorial Day or Memorial Day weekend, or if she could wait until the Green Expo to do something there. So that's that. Anyway, should be a guest at the next meeting, and probably Mary Morgan also. A um, very minor point to Tim. We have a calendar, the Green Committee. Uh, I think I can put these dates and the link on okay. that calendar. Okay. And it should be showing up uh, when you go to your town email. Okay. That'd be great. Okay, and, but uh, that link uh, is for all the meetings? Uh, yes, we typically, sorry, I didn't look at this. Yes, so typically we set them for the calendar year. Good. Yeah. Good. And yeah, I believe we typically mm -hmm. does it year. We put them on a calendar. Good. Okay. Okay, great. <laughs> okay, I don't know if Christina is joining us or not, uh, but we're just going to go ahead. Okay. So, um, we're going to really just devote this to your visit. Um, and I don't know if the two of you want to sort of, uh, I don't know if, if any of us have any questions for you. Um, how do you want to do this? Well, I would like to hear um, how it went with Chief at the EOC. Okay. Because um, that rose at the gathering yesterday as a real uh, central focal point for you guys and him and the town. Sure. I, I can safely say that it was probably the single most impressive uh, sort of connection I've ever seen with the police chief and the emergency management function and also the connectivity and the relationship with the local utility. Very impressive. Uh, you have a very impressive, I read it last night, you have a very impressive emergency uh, operations plan, comprehensive plan for the town. Again, I've been involved with emergency management uh, 
uh, concepts and, and protocols for a long time. And it's probably one of the best comprehensive emergency management plans for a town I've ever seen. I think that could be in no small part to your proximity to New York City uh, and also your isolation as an island and also how you are connected by two ferry systems at the end of the, of the fork of Long Island. And I think it will really, uh, it, the chief and how they take care of the utility folks when they come here for outages and things like that is very refreshing. Not a lot of municipalities or towns do that. And just, the, just simple things like uh, hosting the utility uh, crews at say like the fire station or the town offices as opposed to just kind of letting them do whatever they do it can help with visibility too because if people see utility folks just kind of taking breaks in their trucks and seemingly random places then people's imaginations kind of fill in the gaps like well they're just there's trees down everywhere why are they just sitting in their trucks and they might not realize that they're taking a union prescribed break so just having them in the pocket of say like the town's care um, making sure that they've got everything they need as far as food and lodging and water breaks uh, hot drinks and everything that they need to do their job well it really speaks to how uh, focused the chief and and the department is on on making sure that 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 process works really well during an outage so i think it, it will be really helpful for the e-tip process to kind of leverage that relationship that the chief has cultivated over the years with with the utility response so from my perspective um very impressive uh, connectivity i've never seen a police chief that had utility uh level um, maps and just that knowledge of of the local town and i think it also again speaks to island life and and keeping this island as safe as as you possibly can at on a variety of levels so that's just a kind of a broad uh broad overview and, and he was very forthcoming with a lot of the, the plans and and things like that and gave us a nice uh critical infrastructure list that um we did ask him if it was okay to share with the national lab folks and he said that that, that would be okay so um i hope that i hope that helps kate did you have any uh anything to add to that visit yeah so we were also able to look at some of the outage maps that they created from Sandy. Um, so we highlighted the different roads that um, that came back at a certain time. And just having that amount of information is wild. He said one person, there were three different crews and a police officer for each crew that was out um, restoring power. So and their amount of investment in getting the power back is Obviously, it's critical infrastructure, so they feel really it's a really important thing for them to be involved in. Um, but just having that information available, even when it's not necessarily being shared over a fiber optic ne network, <laughs> he's able to go check each road and check where everyone is. So that's just another thing I think that would be important to make. Um, a little bit more accessible so he's not required to be out at each spot checking manually if whether power is back on each road um, just in terms of the where maybe you hope to go with resilience and grid restoration when you do have outages um, but that was just something else that i think um, really spoke to the deep investment of the of the police chief can i just hear Absolutely. It, I think it, it just emphasizes, and, I, and I, I've said this before, that, that the power company uh, is uh, not only a, nat a natural ally in our efforts going forward, but has to be an essential ally in our efforts going forward. So, you know, there are going to be differences. They have their own needs, their own agenda. Um, and, you know, there are going to be problems going forward, but they are natural and essential uh, allies in this effort. I think that um, it, 
you know, when Sandy was approaching, we were all <laughs> waiting to see where it would land. And it went a little bit west of us. So we were spared the worst of it. But I think we all feel that that's going to happen here at some point. Um, and that looking at the um, outcomes and the impacts where it did hit on Western Long Island and Northern New Jersey um, would help uh, frame the scale of what we're trying to defend against. Um, because, you know, that was, I don't know how long they were out in the towns up west, but, you know, that's when uh, at lunch yesterday, Joe Fenora said that, as you said, you know, we feel pretty secure about a temporary outage. Um, uh, what we need to build is if the lines, if the line is, you know, if the connection to the mainland is disturbed by a major shipping thing, or if we're out for a protracted period of time. And I think, you know, that seems unlikely just when you sort of contemplate it. But if you were to look, if the lab folks and the analysts were to scope what happened with Sandy, um, we're not ready, I don't think, for a Sandy scale event. Are we? I don't know. Actually, Cliff Clark brought that up a little bit yesterday. We we're discussing just the, the timing of the tides because it hit when we were a lower tide. It hit a low tide. And it hit, if it had it hit at a higher five tide, and a half foot surge. said it would have been really um, much worse. Much worse. Yeah. Well, you are susceptible to a major grid event further down Long Island towards the city as well. So if anything happened in that in that region, and let's just say, you know, the majority of Long Island was cut off, you're even more vulnerable uh, in your location here. And I just want to add one more thing about the visit. Uh, the chief did um, emphasize how important keeping the communication tower powered up uh, mm -hmm. by the landfill facility was. So um, just looking at all of the different players that operate and, and work within that tower space, who, what companies have generators, what is the supply chain for fuel for those generators, what are the memorandums of understanding or agreement with those different players, like the different communication companies, say like Verizon or other that, that have a, a presence on that on that platform. Thank you very much. Talking about a technical single point of failure. And that's that's a very uh, good point. You have single point of failure in communications. You have single point of failure or close to it in in power supply onto the island. So the, you know that's something to keep in mind and something to address uh, specifically. Chiefs on it. One of the first things he said, uh, one of his big focuses was interoperability of the radio systems. So being able to speak to the public works department, potentially any county or state uh, law enforcement, federal, just even if you don't actually have that capability, uh, and that's all typically a function of cost. You know, some of, some of those handheld radio sets can be upwards of $500 each uh, that can go across the radio spectrum, but just having that awareness of where you are with interoperability and where you want to be that's that's the name of the game right there so the, the chief definitely is razor focused on emergency management and again sometimes that that falls to a fire chief and uh that's a complete sidebar but over time i'd be interested to see how that developed here in shelter island as opposed to i've seen it typically falls to a fire chief in a town just because um when you think of disaster recovery or preparedness. It's like sometimes, a, or most of the time, it's like a fire department function or it's a separate function within a town or a hospital or something. Well, we'll see how that evolves um, when there's a changing of the guard, right? Well, they do have um, quarterly um, meetings between um, PD and fire. I'm sure, uh, yeah. Fire chiefs and the, um, the communications between the two, the radio systems have all been coordinated, so. And as well as with the EMS. So they're pretty good working together. Yeah, that's, that's but great. I think also because our fire department is all volunteer, 
And so it's easier for PD to be the point person because they are, you know, employees of the town, whereas the fire department's all volunteer force. So it's hard yep. for them to be in charge of all emergency management. So I had a question about your, your visit. Are you going to sort of put together a whole report? Um, what, what will you take with all this information um, that you gathered in the last day and a half? We'll pull together our notes from all of our meetings and visits um, and have an, another meeting with Tessa um, and Jenny from NREL mm -hmm. prior to our, um, our next meeting okay. in a couple weeks. Yeah. Although next week is Thanksgiving week, so we'll, do, we'll probably yeah. do it the, yes. early in the week of our next meeting. Um, yeah. And then will we have access to that too? Yeah, I can I like can put it on the yeah. on the oh, drive for sure. Yeah. Yeah. For all of us too. Any other questions, thoughts? Well, I think we're in the uh, trying to narrow down the scope of our technical assistance project. Mm -hmm. um, so, is that ball now in your court, or are you looking to us, or? How how um, you know what what are the next steps with arriving at a at a scope that we're going to commit to well, or all agree to? Well, the next step will be the lab mm -hmm. lab involvement. Um, but like I said, they're um, assigning a tech lead who will move forward with the scope of work, um, and the scope of work is sort of a living document. So, and it's an iterative process, so we can come to a, an idea of what we want to focus on, and then we'll spend a long time going back and refining that. Um, and that will be led by the tech lead based on what they need to know, what, they, what access to data they have, based on what the priorities for the community. Um, because this is, it is all really community driven. It's really what you all want to focus the project on and we're here to um, hear from you present back what we heard and then use that as a tool um, to help you refine um, just a question for the two of you do you need any other information from us uh, diagrams for example of the uh, landfill area or anything like that would that help uh, Anrel? so um, Absolutely. Okay. Yeah, based on our visit yesterday at the at the landfill and public works uh, facility, any anything you have as far as like site plans and, and things like that would be really helpful. Okay. Um, even if they are, um, just like the chief said, anything you, you probably have a lot of public access documents, but if you if it's front of mind and you can send send them to us um, without us hunting around, that that's really helpful. Sure. Uh, but we're more than happy to to gather and look to if things are available on that town website or, or other sources, so. I did get my hands on the original solar plan for the landfill, so Joe is gonna scan them, because they're rather oh, large, yeah. and then we'll send them to you too. Awesome. Oh, that's um, great. Yeah, I looked at them up, it wasn't impressed, but it has a lot of potential, I think. Yeah, those are helpful, even if even if it was a stalled or, or a project that didn't go through, mm -hmm. uh, sharing that with the lab folks, it can really, kind of tell the story of what you were thinking in the beginning and especially if it was say you know uh, old, you know say five years ago or, or longer um, years ago yeah but I think the original solar plan didn't take the contours into account because mm -hmm. if you look at how they organized it, it it didn't make any sense based on the actual contour of the land mm -hmm. so I think it was just kind of done from a flat survey awesome. and I think so it's probably a better way to approach it but it's good information, so I'll get it to you guys. Yeah, a lot of the, when you, let's say fast forward to a potential point in the future where you are gonna deploy a solar uh, array or field, a, a lot of the newer, um, or a lot of the newer techniques with solar companies, they're starting to use drones and different software uh, packages that can actually um, analyze the, the topography a lot better than some of the previous uh, tactics and, and sort of uh, procedures that they had used before, just like 
you know, co-opting information from Google Earth and things like that. It's gotten a lot more robust. So um, there could be some other efficiencies or um, plans for future solar farms that could have a better, better outcome at this point in time, I think. I was thinking we should use a drone to for the school roof. Um, so you get a better idea of what that looks like. I thought Brian said Mike was willing to take him up there now. What's that? To Brian yesterday and he said Mike was, was uh, willing to take him up there. Well, we looked out the window. Oh, okay. We, we couldn't. Oh. Uh, really could see sort of one part of the roof. Um, and then, I mean, at some point, I assume you want to have PSUG builds or fuel data, all that stuff for the municipal buildings? I think that what would be really helpful in anticipation of the next meeting with NREL is to come up with a list of the data that you have and have access to or potentially could have access to. Mm -hmm. So like those bills or um, the solar plans or um, anything having to do with the energy outlook mm -hmm. of the area, um, like those, the utility maps, things like that. And we can make time in our meeting with NREL to present that um, so that they have an understanding of what they can use and what data they might need to spend time finding. Okay. Because access to data, as we understand from our conversations with the labs, is the one of the most difficult things that they run into. The data. Yeah. yeah. It's just having having access to that. Um, I mean, we can because we've done it before. Uh, the fuel bills are here, um, literally, and. Um, and then the PSNG, actually, the last time we did it for the Clean Energies Community Program, uh, PSNG actually supplied all the all that data to us uh, for all the buildings and all the, and it's beyond what you saw. It's the medical building, it's yeah. dock lighting, it's all sorts of stuff um, that may or may not be useful, but uh, so we can do that. But do you want, do you, do you want us to just say this is the data we can get, or do you want us to actually get start getting data? Or just wait until I would I wouldn't spend time getting it at this point um, because you, you probably I wouldn't spend time okay. doing that yet. Yeah. But compiling a list so that they okay. can winnow it down yep. would be really helpful. Okay. Yeah. Uh, PSEG can tell us uh, how many solar energy systems there are on right. the farm. Right. I had to permit them all. And uh, I think Megan and I discussed that, that the town might be able to, to give us some parameters on, on data in terms of, uh, you know, the number of large central air conditioning systems that, uh, that might be on the island, you know, the large loads that are out there. So, you know, necessary, we can make some projections uh, and so forth and so on. And then perhaps even, you know, load curves mm -hmm. uh, down to even the circuit level. Uh, PS might be able to provide that I would expect. You know, they're monitoring all of that. You had uh, brought up the question of uh, refrigeration. Where are the big refrigeration operations? Did, um, did you and uh, was the emergency management um, conversation, uh, was there anything about the food, you know, food supply, refrigeration, this, how we're going to keep food cold when the grid's down. Is there a touch on that mm -hmm. in the meeting? Um, but I think after a tour of the island, I think it's I think it's safe to say it's I, IGA is the the center point, I think, for most of the refrigerant, like the bulk. You'll see at Sylvester Manor um, what we've got going over there. Yeah, so those two. And the, to the school. And the yeah. school and also the deer, um, the freezers for the venison. It's right, a big part of the food supply. So I think it's just adding those elements into your your matrix. Um, it's it's in the plan too. So in the, in the emergency operations plan. So um, 
I think it's just really adding that to the whole planning uh, process to say, okay, you know, do we want to back up uh, a critical refrigeration uh, facility somewhere uh, as a part of ETIP? Does the IGA have their own uh, backup generators? They do, yeah. Yeah. For, for X. I don't know how yeah. many hours or yeah. days they could have one. We might want to put you or establish a contact with Diane and the IGA mm -hmm. um, for this. So something I mentioned to um, Kate yesterday was that uh, the town board budgeted for a facilities master plan this year to start doing um, start doing an analysis of all of our our municipal buildings and um, to do a needs assessment and figure out you know, how we should or if we should make changes what changes we need to make to the buildings that we have um, and so we were thinking that the whole ETIP grant would go very well hand in hand with the facilities master plan um, because you know a lot of our buildings are old they're not necessarily energy efficient they are not necessarily weatherproofed <laughs> for, for lack of a better term you know you feel a nice breeze through the windows sometimes um, so these are all things that we're going to be looking at you know as a town as far as our facilities go and so um, you know as ETIP kind of works on their plan. We're going to hopefully work on a facilities master plan and hopefully the two can work together really well so that whatever we come up with creates better efficiency and, um, you know, just to put that out there, that's kind of part of the plan. That was why I was very excited when we got this because I was like, this will go wonderfully with, you know, looking at what we have and determining what needs to be renovated or remodeled. Uh, you say you've budgeted, but no contractor, no organization has been selected yet? Um, well, we have, um, there is an engineering firm that works with municipalities that comes in and does a free walkthrough and a needs assessment. So we're going to reach out to them and have them do that just to get the ball rolling. Okay. Um, and so that'll be like our first step. Roughly when? Probably in January. Yeah. Yeah, and and it, we might explore the same with PSE and GD. They they provide uh, energy audits and information. I don't I don't know about this particular uh, company, but that's something we can ask or Joe can ask. Yeah. So yeah. it's okay to get as so much we'll information getting, exactly from as many sources as possible. Right. So we will have information coming from a whole bunch of different sources. So we'll have an engineering firm that can do a good needs assessment so that we can share that information with NREL and, and the program and so that they can see, you know, what we have to work with too. Because that'll come into play when you're talking about solar, you know, do you have structural stability to put solar on a roof? That comes into play. So hopefully with the two things working hand in hand, we'll have a lot of information to work with. Is that likely to lead to an RFP for um, outside consultant planning firm probably yeah mm -hmm. well it'd be interesting to think about um the goals that go into the rfp for you know net zero or however you want to frame the um the energy component of what you're looking to um you know adaptively reuse or build new or tear down or whatever um so um you know the town doesn't yet have a stated um, goal as some communities do for 50% uh, reduction by X or net zero by Y. Um, and it'd be interesting to start to contemplate whether um, just, you know, adopting a resol non-binding resolution that sets an ambition um, would be maybe examples from other communities that as you're getting to know Shelter Island might be relevant for that kind of um, you know, intention setting for the long haul. I think, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, though, we've got at least in the draft a comp plan, uh, you know, at, at a minimum, we're lining up behind the state goals and the federal goals, mm -hmm. uh, right. as, as far as that's concerned. But, you know, that's, that's also a matter of priorities uh, as well. I mean, you know, resilience, 
uh, you know, uh, could be, you know, if the first priority is resilience, meaning reliability, you know, that needs to be stated uh, early on as well. Not that, that the two objectives can't coexist, but I'm just saying, you know, that's, that's about priorities and we will need to early on establish priorities. So, so I think we, we do have some draft uh, language in the draft comp plan. That's yeah, true. Lining up behind the state, which is, uh, and, and the federal government, which are pretty ambitious goals, I would think, you know. Yeah. So it's all in the, it's all in the draft. Yeah. yeah. So, it is. Oh, well, I can. <laughs> <laughs> it's all my way. Utility, sustainability, and resilience, yeah. that chapter. I'm speaking of the comp plan, so uh, would it be helpful to share, to share that with you, particularly the... Um, so it's uh, very easily accessible on yeah, the TAL website. It is. And we can pop it on the Google Drive, too. Um, that chapter is posted already uh, in the... Oh, uh, it is, okay. Yeah. On the it's Google on the Drive. Google Drive. Yeah. There you go. So if you have any problems, let us know. And, if, and again, it's a draft. It's going through. Yeah. It's, not a new <laughs> <laughs> it's a work in progress. So, um, you know, if you have any suggestions um, you know, related to all the other islands and places that you've been working with, that would be helpful to us. Um, that'd be helpful. Any other thoughts about, you know, hearing from you just on uh, uh, sort of uh, seeing everything? Yeah. Any thoughts that you have? Um, so I just made a little list of the priorities that I feel like I have heard over the last day or so. Um, and what I feel like I've heard the most of is managing the load curve and concurrently preparing for upcoming electrification requirements and goals of New York State, um, how to have resilience in an outage, specifically a significant one, and potentially creating a resilience hub, um, tying in all of this work to the facilities master plan um, and to the comp plan, and then growing the renewables, gro growing renewables in your energy portfolio um, and planning for future growth in water, energy, and infrastructure. And I'm wondering if you feel there's any that are higher up on the priority list of that, or if I've missed anything. I've had communications to that. Yeah, yeah, yes. I think that is the, yeah. certainly. A, it's right there with energy. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, you mean the communication system? Yeah. Right. Yeah. Right. Again, the single point of failure, yep. you know, concerns me. Uh, cell phone service in parts of this island are already, already <laughs> still spotty. Yep. Uh, and internet still spotty. Yeah. And, you know, Shaky. It's a sunny day. Yeah, and then there's the whole, um, you know, community education and communication component, which I think um, is going to be a key component for us to absolutely uh you've got that to, <laughs> to <the> pants. <laughs> yeah. to go ahead that's her middle <laughs> charity no problem <laughs> <laughs> um you know one thing when we were visiting the south ferry yesterday it was a very calm day and there wasn't a lot of tidal movement so we couldn't really it wasn't a good day to show you slack tide was it uh Yes, so it wasn't it wasn't a great day to show you the potential area between South Ferry and the other side. Um, where what this view where it can really work. Um, so that that's the area that we were thinking about for exploring tidal power. Mm -hmm. You also get really strong currents by North Ferry. North Ferry, North Ferry too. Very strong currents. People don't realize it, and they're swimming at Sunset Beach. Next thing you know, they're like, Whoo! No, actually, kayak or a paddle. So I swim there. there. Yeah. yeah. I'm very aware of it. I can swim for 10 minutes and still look up and, and you're in the same, same place. place. Yeah. 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 
And it depends on what like the tide is. Like a stationary swimming pool. Yeah. That's what I was thinking. <laughs> yes, cool. it is. It's a little bit frustrating. Yeah. Because that's not why I was swimming over the water. You can watch people sailing backwards. Yes, yes, that's, yes. It's very strong. You got all the sails up and they're actually sailing back. <laughs> yeah, yeah, and the bay constables spend a lot of time untangling the anchors and lines of boats that oh. drag onto each other because yeah. that's a narrow, yeah. that's a pinch point there across from the Sunset Beach facility. Yeah, it's a bad yeah. anchorage. <laughs> but anyway, that's something that we are interested in. Yeah. Uh, oh, go ahead, please. On the, on the point of communication, um, a couple of the questions that I asked yesterday are around uh, sort of public reaction to projects in, in communities that you're familiar with, other island communities. I, I guess what I, one thing that I'm, I'm trying to sort of anticipate and understand is what kinds of, um, you know, how people on Shelter Island um, might react to some of these projects and how the types of communication that, you know, that we create can um, address that. So in other words, I think, you know, there's a, there, there is a tendency sometimes for people to hear that, you know, the town is undertaking a project or we have a grant to, for a new project. And, and, you know, as, as Sarah described, you know, for some people, the, the reaction is, why, there's a, no problem here. Why are you solving a non-existing problem? And and so I'm just I'm trying to to think about ways that we that we can frame what we're doing that will help people understand. Um, you know, I think uh, Sarah made the point that a lot of these initiatives are are actually this came out of dinner last night, sort of uh, related to uh, wellness and health and public health. Mm -hmm. um, you know, and I, so I'm, I'm interested in in that feedback from you as to what other what other islands have experienced. What you know, and I don't know if you get that data. Do you? Do you? I. My inclination is to let the data speak for itself, and once this project is at a point where there's some level of information on the techno-economic analysis of or risk analysis and put it in um, in dollar signs and mm -hmm. say, well, you might pay this amount of money to prevent this, but if we don't invest over time in this infrastructure, then at one point in time, we're going to be spending X amount of dollars managing this problem. And then it's going to create the same we're going to have to do the same thing that we started doing, mm -hmm. um, but much more abruptly. So we so, so we will have we we will actually have that kind of data too. I think that that's something. I just wrote it down on my priorities list, but I think that that would be something if you're anticipating a lot of or any pushback from the community, especially when it comes to spending tax dollars on these projects or. Um, I think one of the benefits too of ETIP is that it hopefully will put you in a position to apply for federal grants. Mm -hmm. um, but I think there's always that, well, we mm -hmm. are spending time, we are spending whatever else um, on these projects. So I think having that as another priority, just to have something in your back pocket um, for those communications is really important. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, the, when you visited the library yesterday, you heard that uh, there was a, a, a lot of money, the town approved a lot of money, voters mm -hmm. approved mm -hmm. a lot of money for that project. And I think a vital part of that was the communication that came from Terry Lucas and, and the library. Mm -hmm. I mean, they, they really did a magnificent job of, of laying out why a library that a lot of people thought was working just fine, um, you know, could really, could really, why everybody would benefit from, yeah. from you know, from the additional uh, investment. Yeah, I mean, piggybacking on or supporting what Sarah said, you know, part of this process as we go forward has to be, you know, information and education mm -hmm. uh, more generally because, you know, we're all in this together. Uh, you know, we're helping to lead uh, this process, but, but people have to be engaged and supportive, and that's the mm -hmm. final. And it isn't always money. It, it is, right. it is uh, right. there, there are access, you know, people, 
um, you know, they cherish their water view. Perhaps mm -hmm. if there's a project that mm -hmm. is, you know, going to affect that somehow, you could get pushback. I know that's happened in other island communities. Mm -hmm. You know, and you know what I'm talking about. <laughs> and, and and I just, you know, so so to the extent that we can focus on on you know, the, the benefits and, and the problems that you may not see now, but that could, you know, that, that these, these investments and these activities could benefit everybody, including the guy who doesn't want, you know, to look at something in the water. Yeah, I think it's, it's tough, but I think that there always is obviously some level of pushback for anything that, anything sure. you shed or um, energy project or, public infrastructure related, but I think that if we, I think that we should definitely add this as a ongoing um, piece of the puzzle going forward and just communicating at each stage and um, being really transparent with the community will help. I have to, if I may, I have to add this point from experience, okay? 32 years ago, I, I was given a, a, a an assignment, a task by my boss, who was a bit of a hardhead and, uh, tough, you know, tough but fair, um, uh, to, you know, uh, develop, uh, well, back up. Um, the, the company I work for serve, serves the, uh, the Jersey Shore, among other areas. And the Jersey Shore uh, is is fair to say, you know, conservative, okay, even to this day. But along the Jersey Shore, it's it's basically conservative. The company felt they needed to reinforce a transmission line down a main road, you know, basically, you know, several counties. People didn't want to hear about it. We don't we don't want this transmission line. But at the same time, you know, this is the early eighties. The shore was growing, okay, and of course, air conditioning was growing and summer peaks growing. So the hand was on the wall. So we came up with this alternative, which is basically a demand response system, which is, you know, radio control of <clears throat> central air conditioners uh, to cycle them for 15 minutes on, 15 minutes off. You're able to manage the peak. It's a wonderful technology and some of you already know about it uh it's evolving into the internet of things now uh but anyway uh he gave me this assignment uh and then as i got up to leave he said he laughs at me and he says you'll never get these people to to allow you to control their air conditioners i'll never forget it. he said that to me three years later we had sixty thousand participants in the program, okay? We, you know, uh, basically the, we, you know, talk to them like adults, okay? We told them the truth, right? We gave them the alternative. We, we gave them the facts as, as best they knew. And then we asked, you know, for their help in this. And we had, you know, in relatively conservative Jersey Shore counties, not unlike, you know, Suffolk County, okay? Um, you know, 60,000 participants. So, you know, I'm just saying, you do this in the right way and you bring people along and you, you educate them um, and not merely, you know, talk down to them or instruct them. You can make it happen. Uh, you were going to say something before. Charity. I want to say several things based on everything that everyone's been talking yeah. about. Uh, but getting back to the communication, um, you know, could you potentially have a, you know, like a, a subset of your your function here, like you know, like an e-tip update in the paper, or mm -hmm. you know, like a, a green green updates, and something like that. It's like an ongoing little snippet in the local paper that everybody can access, mm -hmm. uh, whether it's online or they're flipping through with their coffee and uh, getting their hands dirty uh, in the morning, that might help. Um, and 
along the lines of um, kind of the things that, that, that Steve has really highlighted, like a lot of historical context on adoption of technology. And um, I remember our visit at the South Ferry <clears throat> talking about electrification of ferries and how um, I think Mr. Clark said, oh, yeah, I've, I've been looking into that. And, you know, uh, we're in an inund inundation zone here and the charging infrastructure. So when you when you hear pushback or uh, highly intelligent analytical feedback on things that people look at, for me, that is feedstock for this ongoing process. It's, you know, if everybody agreed on everything, you know, I, I don't know if we would even have progress because it, everything just kind of stagnates. So if they can have floating substations off for offshore wind farms, I think the technology either near term or medium term will be there to provide some sort of submersible unit that could survive an inundation zone and charge a commercial ferry at the same time. And I think it's just kind of keeping an eye on innovation. You know, how many, you know, does everyone remember the old craftsman drills with the cord? And, you know, back in the, even back in the 70s or the 80s, if you said, oh yeah, in, in very short order, we're gonna have uh, cordless hand drills. People might've thought you were a little, little kooky or thinking a little sci-fi. Uh, we all remember when cell phones hit the, the first you know, iteration of them. How amazing was that? And then they had an attaché case. <laughs> right, exactly. <laughs> Our laptops. Induction hmm. charging. I mean, when I, when, you, when I had my first iPhone if so, and someone told me, you know what, at some point in time, you're going to just be able to lay it on a device on a counter without even plugging in and it's going to charge again. Well, that's just sci-fi thinking. So when I think, when I put my sci-fi hat on, so to speak, say 20 years from now, I think it's completely, even sooner, it's completely plausible that you drive an electric car onto an electric ferry, and even on the short trip across, uh, across the, the, the straits, your car is charging through induction on the ferry itself. And it has all the requisite safety features that a ferry like that would need. Yeah, so it's that's where the technology is heading when you're talking about massive electrification of the transportation infrastructure, where right now where we have a massive petroleum and fossil fuel infrastructure. And so we, we, we typically don't want for anything when we're driving our regular internal combustion engine cars. There's gas stations everywhere, every kind of fuel uh, you can think of. I think I even filled my truck up on the way back from Eastport the other day with straight gas, no ethanol. So, you know, there, we're spoiled for choice with petroleum. And I think it's at some point in the near future that that could potentially look like that for electrification. So it's, I think it's important to keep that in mind. And then the original thought that I had earlier um, was that, again, thinking forward, we always hope that a catastrophic event doesn't happen. And if we can somehow massage ourselves uh, and, and help spread that kind of thinking throughout our, our populations, that we need to prepare for those horrible events. We have the history books are full of them and they keep unfolding every day, whether they be war related or transportation related or weather related or a combination of all these different things. In the, in the future, if something catastrophic happened to this area, I think every community has to ask themselves, do you want to be that marquee New York Times article that says you were the community that was able to weather it because of all the good work and planning that you did? Or do you want to be that news article of a community that was completely devastated? And I think that that is like a really important sort of philosophical point to keep in mind going forward. Um, and I, Lahaina just keeps coming to mind, you know, um, mm -hmm. millions of tourists, uh, you know, flooding through, <clears throat> excuse me, that area over the years, untold of amounts of money, changing hands, important economic engine of the, the Hawaiian economy, not just on Maui, but for the entire state. And you have an entire uh, town burnt to the ground and a lot of reasons why that happened and that they keep coming up in discussions, including ETIP. And I think the, I, I'm, I'm fairly certain that Lahaina will, will feature prominently 
either within ETIP or another government program very soon. Mm -hmm. Once the the emotional heartstrings, uh, you know, kind of calm to that point. Uh, so I think it's it's just something to keep in mind. You know, where where do you want to be uh, when when something really big happens? And you're well on your way. I and mean, like like Joe said, and others have echoed, you're ready for the you know, sort of historical precedent type of events that have already happened, you know, like a, a, a really solid storm that knocks out power. You've got that normal response well in hand. And I think you have an opportunity to continue to build on that. Yeah, and not to, you know, play on fear, um, but I think cyber attack also is one that we should be thinking mm -hmm. about. It was so, the economic impact on the real property industry and, you know, when the county was and is still recovering from this was um, people couldn't close on their, you know, on their sales of their properties for months and months and months. Um, and then the other thing we haven't touched on today, although you mentioned the inundation zone is the coastal resilience piece of this. And I'm not sure how, you know, if it's just another um, wake up call that will help the community get behind whatever it is we're doing to transition away from fossil fuels towards um, independence, resilience, batteries. Oh, you know, we haven't talked about this, but there was a major battery storage project up on Oregon Road in South town of South Hold that went down in flames, literally because of um, tremendous fear about the ability to put out a fire should there be one. There happened to be a um, absolutely devastating head-on crash involving a, an electric vehicle and the fire department couldn't put out the fire and four people died and, and you know right actually between greenport and the orient ferry on the coast um, and that was around the same time that this big battery facility was being proposed and the amount of um emotion and um you know and uh fear that played into the inability for a community to even, and the siting was poor. It was in a greenway in the ag area, and um, you know they didn't they I mean, didn't handle a constrained transportation. Yeah, uh, yeah. Issue as well, um, being able to move emergency vehicles in and out of the south. Because we've talked about storage, but we haven't really right. talked about what that implies, right. and the um, and then on, on the sort of hopeful side, I think of this island as, um, you know, so keen on being more self-sustaining, more resilient. There are jokes about, you know, um, sinking the ferries and just close, you know, I mean, they're, they're, the island, um, the more it can be self-sustaining, the better. So I think it, it will be responsive to the idea of some, you know, uh, leading edge innovation as a way to increase um, the island's ability to function independently. So, interesting. I, yeah, I think it's also um, addressing some future needs that we know we're going to have. So we already know that there is some inconsistency in our electric grid. We know that people get unreliable voltages. We know that there's fluctuations in power. But we also know that we're working from a building code from 2017. And so once the state approves the updated building code, there's going to be a significant number of changes. Um, there's going to be more requirements for electrification of certain things. There's going to be restrictions on the use of certain fossil fuels for different types of uh, appliances, appliances and things like that. So it's going to add more demand to the grid. And we know our grid is unstable. So any way we can shore up what we have and we can help backfeed and we can help um, really create a more robust and reliable infrastructure that's going to serve us in the long run, even if it's not for something catastrophic, but even just in our day-to-day -day functioning, because as more cars go electric, you're going to need more charging stations. As more of your appliances go electric, you're going to need to have more demand. So all of these things are going to continue to put strain on the system and the infrastructure. And so we need to kind of prepare for that now because the state's already making changes that are going to impact us. Um, and once the building code makes changes, that's going to continue to impact us. So these are things that are going to happen whether we're ready or not. And then we're going to be either forced to catch up or um, we're going to be prepared and ready to take on 
whatever change they're going to put upon us. So I think that's part of it too, is, is trying to responsibly plan for the future and using the resources that we have at our disposal. And this program is a really great source of information and resources to help get us ahead so that we're not left behind. Um, so I think that's really important thing to think about because it's not just catastrophic long-term outages, which we are less prepared for than a short-term, like a week-long outage we can handle. But if we're out for a month or two months or something significant happens up island and we're cut off, that we're not as prepared for. But, um, you know, even as we were saying day to day, there are weaknesses. I mean, I lose complete cell service here sometimes at home, all over the place. Um, go through electronics like crazy because they don't charge as well or there's something funky happening. Um, and so it's good to keep all that in mind as we move forward through the process. So it's not just for those catastrophic things, but it's also for a more efficient day to day functioning and just anticipation of what's coming down the pipe because um, the state is making some significant changes that we're going to have to account for. I'm just thinking also of, uh, you know, Tim mentioned the resistance uh, that can happen here to um, examples from our neighbors from the South Fork. Um, if you try to bring in a success story or a, a you know, a, a concept, but I think that actually we'll, we'll get better um, traction with examples from island communities away. Um, so the fact that we have all this precedent in the first and second cohorts and because, um, you know, on the flip side of that battery issue, um, there, I'm sure there are emerging success stories for store battery storage and how that can be, um, uh, you know, all the concerns about fire protection and all of that can be addressed, have been addressed elsewhere. And if that comes from, you know, some main island or the vineyard or Nantucket or Block Island, I think, um, I think we might get more sort of buy-in and uptake. I, I think that's true. Even beyond DTIF, um, mm -hmm. you know, uh, my, our job as a clean energy team at the Island Institute, ETIF is taking up a lot of our bandwidth. However, we're also tasked with helping island and remote communities with any grant opportunities that we can find and also just meeting them in community and finding things out. My recent trip to Monhegan Island where you have at most maybe, I don't know, there, it, it, it fluctuates, but it's in the tens of how many people live there year round. Mm -hmm. And then they have a really vibrant summer population and their, their island grid is, you know, the output is anywhere between 13 kilowatts and like 130 mm -hmm. kilowatts. So it's a very, very, very small island. However, they want to add solar and some storage. And so they have a really great uh, engineer, his name's Dan Fisher, based in Connecticut, and he found a new tried and true battery storage system that it's, uh, I think it's a lithium phosphate uh, mixture. So it's not, it, it, the, the explosive potential or fire potential has been reduced by a significant amount compared to some of the existing technologies like a Tesla battery or something like that. However, the trade-off is weight. So they can't really appropriately land a helicopter on Monhegan uh, without really a lot of daring do. So they're reliant on a barge system for very heavy objects. However, the form factor of these batteries is like, a, like an English phone box, like, a, like an old fashioned uh, English phone booth about that size. And it's very heavy though. So, if you can get it to the island and get it trucked up to a certain point, uh, and they have a very interesting topography that just kind of goes, it just rises up. So for me, that's a really good trade-off. All right, well, it's twice as heavy as similar units, but it's actually smaller in stature and it has less fire potential. So those technologies are available now. And that those are the learnings, even if we're not, uh, involved in a grant program with Monhegan, we're, we're taking in these learnings and I, I have the spec sheets and everything. So that, I think the, the Island Institute, even as an organization, even slightly beyond ETIP, will, 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 we, hope, we hope to be helpful for you uh, 
to, to cross share the, the, that, that, that technology and learning. So thank you, Island Institute. Yeah, it's <laughs> exciting. Christina, I'm sorry. We, we just have another member here who's on Zoom. Christina, do you have any questions? Hi. Uh, no, I apologize for being late. I wasn't. No, no, I, no. Thought this wasn't happening, um, but I got a text from Sarah. Um, uh, anyway, been listening very with great interest, and I've I've just been thinking about, of course, the as I often do, the threat to the island from rising um, sea levels, uh, because the the northeast or the northwest Atlantic is particularly it's happening faster uh, than other parts of the world, and just our the vulnerability to climate impacts. So. Um, trying to think how to uh, balance, you know, I, I think it's it's incredibly important and effective to talk about the health benefits, the resilience, all of the positive aspects of what we're uh, going to be trying to do. Um, but I think being clear with people about the, the threat from uh, a warming climate or you know, warming atmosphere is um, is also really important. So understand that that people there's a a lot of misinformation out around climate change, um, and so in, the communications on that will be important. But that's what I've been I've been having in the back of my mind as I've been listening to everything. But thank you very much. I'm very sorry we're not on the island and I can't be with you for this visit, but hope to be there in the future. And then we have uh, Evan. Are you there? We have a guest. Evan. It's a little hard to unmute the phone. Oh. Evan, are you there? Hi, hi, hi. Uh, we have a guest, yeah. Evan Howell, who's interested in all of this. Um, Evan, do you have any questions? No, no, no questions. I mean, it's been uh, this is really informative, and thank you to the uh, to the ETIP folks for uh, for all of the work so far and, and to the committee. Um, I, I do, I'm just sitting here nodding my head and I would second what, what Christina just said about, uh, you know, there's just so much to work with and uh, the communications piece is so important. I mean, this is framing it as a quality of life and sustainable development uh, uh, initiative as much as anything. And, uh, you know, it's happening. Uh, whether you agree with the premises or not. So do you want to be, uh, you know, do you want to be behind the curve? Do you want to be ahead of it? And the, the island has a chance to be, uh, you know, this is a bit of a sweepstakes and uh, the island has a chance to be um, uh, something of a laboratory for all of this. Uh, I think, um, so being ambitious with communications where it's a feedback loop where it needs to be, but then is also, um, as somebody brought up, an, an advertisement for what's progressing uh, along the way, I think is, uh, is so important, um, as opposed to sort of a, a flat-footed passivity with, uh, with the communications with the, the community. And then also having the surrogates, the right surrogates involved. You know, the, the ferry piece is so interesting um, you know, that, that they're even, uh, that this is being thought of, uh, are there, you know, are, are there transitional fuels in the meantime, uh, while the battery technology is, is still uh, in in progress uh, that can be explored with the ferry companies? Um, so it's it's a dialogue uh, until the, the the longer term uh, fix is uh, is landed on, um, and just having them be surrogates for this uh, initiative is the school something where we can. Uh, it, you know, there's a jobs aspect to all of this. Uh, is, is there a vocational piece? Biden has a climate core. Um, is there something within the school where the, uh, you know, the, the kids are exposed to this and, uh, and become, uh, you know, fluent in, in what this is? So it, there's just so much to work with. And I think it's incredibly exciting. And uh, so I, not, not so many questions. I'll be uh, curious to see the notes that come back for the next session, but uh, just more um, sort of voicing my, uh, my support for all of this. So thank you again. Thanks, Evan. Albert, do you have anything you want to ask? Yeah, thank you. Okay. I think that's a great point, though, the um, vocational uh, and uh, jobs aspect of this. Um, you know, even Meg's business is, um, you know, growing in response to the crisis around water quality and wastewater. And um, we need more technicians um, and you know there are real opportunities in this realm as well um, 
we should probably look at uh, Suffolk County BOCES. The, uh, it's a, I don't know what's an acronym, acronym for, B-O-C-E-S. It's the vocational training arm. Um, sometimes uh, high school grads who, who aren't going to college get involved in BOCES programs, you know, and uh, it's a, a robust. And, and we have good connections through the school with those programs. Mm -hmm. So that's, that's a, something to think about. Yeah. Yeah, and I think that's it's interesting. That's one of the things that seniors bring up with when I I try, try to talk to seniors regularly. Um, you know, the the idea that if you're if you're not going to go to college, and you know, there there are only a few policemen on the island. Those jobs are not really, you know, what can I do to stay here? Mm -hmm. And I, I think that's a really really excellent, you know, a piece of the communication. And just uh, quickly regarding Evan. Um, He's been, he has, uh, he's a uh, owner of a unit at the Deering Harbor Inn, which is a 7.2 acre site sprawling complex with an um, interesting range of facilities, including some public spaces. And I know that he has um, been talking with their management about ways that they can go green. So that's a, just an interesting facility. It's waterfront, has dock and slips for sailboats, and uh, it, uh, you, you can drive by it. Mm -hmm pointed out um, so, it's just another example of a um, you know a non municipal site that has the potential to be um, experimenting and and uh, setting examples right Evan <laughs> um, I have yeah, a... I, I, it, it's funny in the last uh, in the last few weeks you know they're just a sort of this, it's a Deering Harbor and it's something of a microcosm uh, there are signs that you can see now um, that uh, uh, about um, the prohibition of any uh, uh, personal mobility um, devices, so scooters and such, because of the fear of some of the residents around, uh, you know, the, the battery fires. Uh, and some of that is drawn from, you know, some of the recent fires in the cities with, with the scooters being charged together in, in close quarters. Um, but there is this sort of reflexive reaction to, um, you know, to some of these incidents, which certainly are, are, are you know, to a degree warranted. Um, so it, 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 it really, there, there is with a property like that, uh, that is a big facility. There are so many possibilities, especially as, you know, EVs become more commonplace, um, how to leverage something like that with EVs with, and with, with two way charging becoming more commonplace, how, you know, a, a big piece of property like that can be, so useful in this imperative, um, but also recognizing that there are fears uh, and there are um, misgivings about some of the, uh, you know, some of the technology. It's got real microgrid potential. Yeah. Um, very yeah, very much. So. And they have um, and flat roofs, flat roofs with south uh, south facing uh, 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 roofs. So we've we've actually I've I've kind of ridden shotgun with the manager there who's been on the island for many, many years and is, uh, is very forward thinking about some of these things uh, about uh, transitioning to, um, to low carbon uh, energy and, uh, and more efficient uh, sources. So, Sherry. Great. Okay. It's 10, 15. Oh, yeah. oh, could, I, could I just ask a quick question? Yeah, yeah. You sure. Up? So uh, Evan's mention of the ferries and um, the talk earlier about seeing uh, talking with the South Ferry. Um, have you met with Bridge Hunt? Uh, We're doing that eleven thirty, Christina. Oh, perfect. Okay, great. Because Bridge is very concerned about the climate impacts, especially you know seawater rise. But he's got a lot of ideas. So uh, and, and, and the, the group met with Cliff Clark yesterday. That's great. Excellent. Well, terrific. I think uh, to the farm. in the interest of time, because we do want to get to bridge at 1130 and they have mm -hmm. a very tight schedule at a certain point. So um, if anybody doesn't have anything more to add, a motion to adjourn. adjourn. Second. Right. Thank you. And I just want to say, um, just roll together, the, I really, really, I mean, I think we all really, really appreciate your paper. Um, it's beyond the, you know, I was expecting it to be very wonderful, but I think it's been beyond that. Um, it's just been enlightening for us, also, Charity, to say she's learning things. Too. I mean, it's just, I think all of us, it's just, it's been really, we really appreciate this. And just your, your, 
if you can tell in what you're focusing on thinking about things. It's just already it's it's really it's terrific. Thank you. So we thank you. Thank you for having us. Likewise. Thank you. Tim lunch. Yeah, so um so uh we're going to you're we're all going to the first I don't know how many of us are going to Sylvester Manor. And then we probably and then eleven thirty we're going to the North Ferry to talk to Bridge Hunt and John Nicolak. And then at noon we can all meet at the Islander for lunch. And then I think you I know you have two PM Zoom call and some other stuff. You have a Zoom facility, you're going back to the cheap later. We could, um, and also sitting in this wonderful room, I was wondering if it would be possible to maybe uh, grab some Wi-Fi and do our e-tip meeting with Martha's Vineyard from, from this facility or something. Check availability. Uh, and also, I don't know, because you'd have to. Think, you'd need a clerk, yeah. Yeah, you'd need, it, it, it's complicated. Yeah, we can, we can go back to the cheek with, yeah. If they use that Wi-Fi, but they're going to be, you're going to be on your own computers, right? Mm -hmm. You just need public Wi-Fi here. Oh, yeah. yeah well, no, we don't. We don't need any yeah, AV infrastructure. Yeah, just, Is the room available? That's what I'm checking. Let's see. Yeah, we, we would just need Wi-Fi. Mm -hmm. Was like two to three. Yes. Yeah. Another ETIP community. <laughs> <laughs> are they in our cohort? They are. Mm -hmm. Yeah. They are. But they have a previous cohort as well. Yeah. And their focus is on um, their water for the most for the most part. Um, well, keeping their pumps running in case of an outage um, and then in case of fire, they have a really big fire concern as well. We have the same issue. Everybody's it's their water by electric. Yeah. Okay. Yep. Same. I, I, I just I, I love the fact that we're all we're all looking at the same sort of issues. Mm -hmm. It's really great. And it's great because even if you choose to focus on one area, mm -hmm. those learnings are maybe elsewhere. If you're if our scope can't quite fit in something mm -hmm. the likelihood that another community is facing mm -hmm. really similar problems is mm -hmm. is high so and that's you know that's part of our role is to share those learnings mm -hmm. and um just be there to bridge that yeah. our hope is to have a gathering with all the cohort three communities mm -hmm. so that you all can oh, sort of go through this together once the scoping is through so um so you can stay abreast of what's going on in those communities. Yeah, you know, it's a really wonderful aspect of this. Yeah. Yeah. And absolutely. I know it's been set up that way, but Oh, it's it's really very cool. Yeah. We can learn from Hawaii, Alaska. There's mm -hmm. so many different different areas that are going through similar issues. Yeah. yeah. Terrific. And the ETIP uh, command, as you will, is expanding. They're actually creating more regions. Uh, including like uh, the Great Lakes or Midwest. Mm -hmm. uh, right now we actually have uh, Beaver Island in Michigan as part of uh, cohort two, mm -hmm. is one of the Island Institute's uh, ETIP communities. So it's a little outside of our uh, purvey, so to speak, but, and there may be adjustments in the future, but for now they're, they're one of our communities mm -hmm. and they're gonna be expanding down into the Southeast and the Gulf States too. So the whole program in it is expanding which is exciting. So there'll be, there is, and will continue to be a national presence with the ETIP mm -hmm. and everything that that involves. Well, I like that. I mean, just the different, how climate change is going to affect all these different regions in different ways. And you know, Long Island is also subsiding. Sinking. So yeah. we don't often talk about that, but. Ge geologically. Yes. Yeah. yeah. Yep. Um, yeah, sea level rise and terra firma <laughs> yes. descent. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's, I mean, I've been here 75 years and I'm particularly familiar with one stretch of beach and it's just been interesting because I can actually see uh, there's a rock that, you know, I, I just know that high tides or things were 
specific places at different times of my life. And it's just shifted so much in my lifetime. And I don't know if, if it's a combination of something sinking, but also, and something rising. So the high tides are much higher than they used to be. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, it's just, it's kind of fascinating, but also. Um, now the Nature Conservancy has a website, coastalresilience.org. You know about that, with all sorts of projections. And the most recent projection I heard from the folks at this eelgrass mat weaving was 15 feet sea level rise by 2100. Yeah. What? Great. Oh, great. Okay. Okay. Um, 